One of the most commonly seen types of waves in introductory physics classes is standing waves. Standing waves are very, very, very important, and they actually represent one of the first types of waves that was ever studied because they represent the types of waves that are associated with harps and violins and guitars and all kinds of stringed instruments. Standing waves occur whenever you have a medium that is constrained at the endpoints. All right? Now, we're going to talk about one type of boundary condition. There's a couple other ones, but this is the most commonly seen in introductory physics, the rigid boundary. At a rigid boundary, we pin the boundary down, the, the medium down at the boundary, so that it can't be disturbed. So the medium can be, in, uh, can be disturbed in between the two boundaries, but the boundaries themselves got to remain where they are. So this is a rigid boundary, can't move. So let's consider a string, like a violin or a guitar string, that has rigid boundaries at both ends, and he's got length L. All right, now here's the idea. The wave has to fit in between these two boundaries. Because if I were to just draw a random rate wave, look at it, here we go. Oop, doesn't work. It has to fit. So that means that only certain wavelengths are going to be allowed. All right, so let's see some situations in which this occurs. All right. We've got this one right here, where the wave does fit. These two points right here represent equilibrium points on the wave. They're called nodes of the standing wave. The opposite is this guy right here. This is a place where the wave moves the most. It's called an anti-node. Now, if I begin with something like that, the string is then going to vibrate back and forth like this. So the standing wave will go between this and that, back and forth, back and forth. The nodes stay where they are, and the anti-nodes go the maximum displacement. People in between do less of the anti-node and more of the node, okay? So it just goes like that. Now, this isn't the only one. We also could imagine having this guy. Now, as this one vibrates, the part that's down is going to go up, and the part that's up is going to go down at the same time. And these guys are just going to vibrate like that. So the other waveform that we'll see is that one. Now, obviously, this is a node. I mean, same thing as it was before we picked up another node in the middle. When we jumped up to the next level, we picked up another node. And look what else we picked up. Another anti-node. So now I got two anti-nodes and three nodes. All right, what about this guy? Well, now we bumped it up again. So we're going to pick up another anti-node and another node. And let's just go ahead and look at it. There it is. Right? So in general, when we do this, we're going to count. And we usually count by just counting the number of anti-nodes. So this is going to be one. This one's going to be two. This one's going to be three. And now let's try to determine the wavelength. Well, in this case, this is only half the wavelength because the whole wave would go oop like that. So that means that L is one half of the wavelength. So the wavelength will be 2L. All right, what about in this case? Well, this is a wavelength. So we'll just say lambda equals L and be done with it. All right, what about here? Well, here the length L is a wavelength and a half. So it'll be 3 halves wavelength. And that means the wavelength will be 2 thirds L. In general, you should be able to convince yourself that the wavelength of the nth harmonic, these are called harmonics, will be given by 2L over N. All right, well, what about the frequency? 
Well, frequency is always equal to speed divided by wavelength. So when I take this speed and I divide by this wavelength, I end up getting n times v over 2l. Now, v over 2l is the lowest frequency that we get. It's the frequency associated with this dude right here, which only has half a wavelength showing. That's called the fundamental frequency, and we'll call it F1. So this is F1. So that means that Fn is n times F1. All right, this makes what we call a harmonic series. It's harmonic because the frequencies are all integer multiples of the same frequency. What that means is if we wait a certain amount of time, all of the waves that fit in between these two nodes will repeat the same period over and over and over again. And that's what makes them sound good together. That it's, it makes what's called a harmony. All right, now, what if I want to change this fundamental frequency? Well, here's a fundamental frequency. How do I change it? Well, it depends on two things. It depends on the speed and it depends on the length. So what happens if I increase the length of this string? Well, it's going to make the fundamental frequency go down. So long equals low frequency equals deep. All right. What about if I make the string shorter? Well, now it's going to make this fundamental frequency bigger. So that means short equals high pitched. And we've seen that before, right? If you look at a bass, it has really long strings and it's really low sounding. Whereas if you look at a violin, it's got much shorter strings and it has a much higher pitch. Same thing happens with the woodwind instruments, but we'll talk about that later. All right. Now, what about the speed? How can I change the speed? Well, we know that the speed of a wave depends only on the medium. Well, the medium in this case is the string. All right. The string has two important properties that are associated with the speed. The tension that it's held under and how much mass density, how heavy is that string? All right. Now, if I increase the tension, and of course we'll do this on a stringed instrument by twisting that little knob at the top, then what that's going to do is it's going to increase the speed. Increasing the speed increases the fundamental frequency and makes it sound more high pitched. All right. What happens if I increase the mass density? Now, this isn't something that I can do. If I've already got the guitar, the mass density is fixed. But if you look at the strings on the guitar, you'll find that the ones that make the lower tones are thicker. They weigh more. And that's because a larger mass density gives rise to a smaller fundamental frequency, a lower note. And so that's why we have the lower notes with these thicker strings so that it's easier to get the lower notes. And I don't have to turn down the tension, you know, so that it won't work anymore. So anyway, that is standing waves with rigid boundary conditions. Now there's another boundary condition that I haven't talked about in this video, and that's associated with a boundary condition that is an anti-node instead of a node. Those are called open boundary conditions or free boundary conditions. Now those are a little bit more difficult to visualize because a free boundary condition means that instead of pinning it down, you're going to let it move as much as it wants to. Now that's a, in order to visualize that, um, what I usually do in class is I take like a, a rod and I put a ring on it and I attach the string to the ring and I just kind of oscillate it up and down like that. And then the ring can go up and down. But that's not really something that we often see with strings. Usually with strings, it's the rigid boundary conditions. But we will see these free boundary conditions um, when we're looking at sound waves that are standing waves. But anyway, for right now, this is standing waves.